so continuing the activities of the morning, uh, we will continue with the fourth talk by Roosbeth, uh, talk about left path algebras and other stuff. Thank you. So if the sound is okay, the sound. All right, so this would be the last talk in this series for me, and I'm gonna talk about the sand pile and Levit pass algebra. So let me just remind you of this game, the sand pile model. So you, you start with a graph. Now imagine my graph looks like this, a loop and vertices, a vertex here. Maybe this one has also another loop. And the model is that it always end up with a sink. So this is a sand pile graph. So you have a directed graph and then here it always ends up in a sink. And remember here you put uh, grains of sand or chips. Oh, thank you. Better. So you put here chips and the chips you can move along that. So if you had four objects, it's the same. So if you had four objects here, for you know, for discrete things sitting here, you can push one here. It comes here, one comes here, one comes here, and one just gets back to this point. Okay, so maybe I would write it in another one that you see the process. So four. So the four would be distributed one here, one here, one here, and one here. And then the next step, look, there is one chip here and there is one edge getting out. So you push that here and this is sync. So it disappears. So that disappears. This one disappears. So it becomes zero, zero, and one. So this model now is reduced to this one, okay? And then we had two facts in sand pile models, two facts. One was, I call this firing, right? I call it a firing or toppling. So two words, if you do this distribution, either you say it fires or you say it topples. Two facts, the order of toppling does not matter. So that was the abelian part. So if you have a bunch of objects here and a bunch of objects here, it didn't matter if you just fire this and that or you fire this and that. And then the most important one is that there exists a unique stable configuration. So eventually you get to a stable one. Look here, there is no more firing allowed and you always end up in the same sort of picture. If you remember that uh, fractals, you always end up with the same fractal. Okay, so a little definition, you know that, but let me just put here definition, sand pile graphs. So by these, it's a finite graph with unique sync. And look, all this can be generalized and so on. But at the moment, there is a unique sync and all vertices connects to sinks. So when I say connects, that means there is a direct path from this ver vertex to these things always. So as you see, this is the case. Anywhere you're allowed to go all the way to the thing. So let's call this a sand pile graph. So now if you have a sand pile graph E, you 
Here is the, so at the moment, it just stays on the level of just a, a game or process. Now here comes the mathematics. So imagine these are your vertices, UIs, and these are finite. And imagine these are the number of grains of sand sitting here, right? I'm just, this is the language I'm gonna use. Ki, so if this is U1, this is four is K1. And the number of sand sitting here, this is the language I'm using. And this represents one configuration, right? That means I'm just putting sands here. And this one, it tells you that whatever number of sands I put here, 10 million, 1 million, and so on, you, you can take your time and reduce it to a unique one. So I can just think of this as a unique configuration. And if you had another one, and I'm just now doing some algebra, I'm adding these. The way I do, just, I mean, if you just show this to me, I, you know, follow your nose, and I just add the grains of sand sitting on one specific vertex. I add them, and then I do the re reduction, right? And the reduction gives me a unique configuration, and that makes it well-defined. Because you could have said, okay, I give you two, you, you add them, and you reduce them in two different ways. Maybe you get two different sums, but because of the configuration, it always gives you the same. So let's call this the sand pile of E. And this gives you a monoid. Of course, it's an abelian monoid because I'm just adding. And zero, if I put nothing anywhere, that gives you a zero of this monoid. Okay. There is a, some very special element here. They call it the max. I don't think this is a very good name for this. But there is one configuration that, can you guess what that would be? So this represents one element here, one configuration that I call it max. I, it, you cannot reduce it anymore. But can you guess what I mean by max? So what would be, I know I'm very vague here, but what do you think the configuration, namely putting numbers here, and somehow that looks like a maximum. So put numbers here, grains of sand here, so that you cannot reduce anymore. And, mm -hmm. If I put everything in a thing, it represents zero because, yeah. So that, that you really can call mean because everything becomes zero, right? But I want this kind of opposite. What if here, you know, there are four edges getting out. I put three. So there is no firing anymore here because I put three. So there is, you know, no reduction here. There is one is going out. So if I put one, this is going to topple and goes back. So I put zero here. I put zero here. Here there are two going out. If I put two, it fires because one goes here and one goes here. So I put one. So basically, on each node, I put one less than the number of edges getting out. Then I call it a max, just that element. Just leave it there as a max. And then, of course, once you have a monoid, you have a group completion, and that's called sand pile group. So sand pile, this is sand pile monoid, and then let me call it GE, the group completion of this. And then you call this a sand pile group. Well, you now start studying the structure of this. So, one of the things I can ask you, I mentioned that so in SPE, so again, in your head, you remember all this configuration with this. So I give you one element E. So let's see just this one, UV. So here, a sample graph. I give you an element here. Maybe here I put one and here is zero. This is sync, so this is zero. 
Now, this one is not going to topple because there are two edges getting out, but there's only one little chip sitting here. So it's not going to topple. So this is my, why I call it one U. Now, can you tell me what I get here as an exercise? Mm -hmm. E, E, let's see. Okay, so you have one. I put one more here, right? So I get two, right? But now this topples because there are two edges getting out. So one comes back here and one goes here. So it's reduced to the same thing. So if I write it in mathematics, E is one U. So E plus E is one U plus one U. 2u and then 2u topples and this becomes 1u e. So I just gave you an idempotent element. So e is called idempotent. So the first question, can you give me the idempotent of any sample monoid? So you look at the graph and tells me with this configuration you get it idempotent. So it's a little research project. Well, I want to give you the answer of that. So this is in a paper by Bobai, if I pronounce it correctly, from University of Chicago. So you have a graph and you want to tell me exactly when you get an, this kind of things, i.e. And it's kind of in interesting because you have a configuration, you put again the same configuration on the top of that, and you start doing the toppling, but you end up with the original state. So I think it's a, it has a nice description. So how am I supposed to do that? Let me develop some language to capture that. So let me call uh, P a partially ordered set. So this just means that you have a relation of this type, X always in related to X. If x is related to y and y is related to x, then it forces that x equal to y. And then if x is related to y and y is related to z, then you go one step further. So this is a partially ordered set. Then I call f a filter, filter. So it's a subset of P. It's called filtered. I think it could be also empty. So imagine it could be empty at the moment. F is called filter if, uh, if X happens to be in F and something larger. So you get something larger of X, then you can say that Y is also in F. So this is the definition I'm going to use here. Filter, there are other definitions for filter. But this one, if you get an X in filter, something larger would be also in the filter. So the way I imagine this is if I'm looking at sort of this is X and this is Y. If X is in my filter, then all these trees, everything is just going to be in the filter. OK, so this is just a language. Now, going back to the sample graph, first, this is finite, of course. Get C. Yeah. That's the standard definition of filter. I'm not using that. Yes, yes. I'm just using the, this weaker version. Yeah. So imagine you have a sample graph, and these are strongly connected components. Strongly connected components, these CIs. So what do I mean? So you look at your graph, and you get a bunch of them that everything is connected to everything. And then maybe something gets out, and then you get another component that everything is connected to everything. Maybe here. But this would not be connected to this one. Otherwise, they would be the whole connected component. So 
everything is connected to everything. If might be something gets out, but it not, it's not going to get in. Otherwise, that would be also in the connected component. So this is your, say, C1, and this is C2. This situation, I write this. And if this happens, I'm going to define a partial order, define partial order. Look, it's all language here. Partial order on C this way. I say C is less than C2 or C2 is larger than C1 if C is connected to C2. So C1 here connects to C2 and C2 is larger. Okay, just that. And now here is the theorem. Not, a, not easy to prove, but as you see, it's not gonna use you know, very complicated mathematics, but you know, you have to go through the proof step by step to see that. Here is the theorem. So you have E a sand pile graph. This is a sand pile monoid. Then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the idempotents There is a one-to-one -one correspondence And the filters of this gadget here, if you believe it. So I get all the connected components. I use this uh, definition that one thing is kind of less than the other if C1 is connected to C2. With this language, you have now the definition of a filter. And the filters, whatever you get, is one-to-one -one correspondence to the idempotence. Let me give you an example. Imagine you're in this situation. So one con this C1 is one connected component and C2 is another connected component. So your C is C1 and C2, or maybe even one more here. Maybe I'll put another one here, C3. Okay. So what are the filters here? One filter is just C2 because anything larger than that has to be in here. But for with C2, there is no other strongly connected component larger than C2. The other one is C1, C2, and C3. All of them. That gives you a filter, of course. And the other one is C3. So there are three of these, and there should be three idempotents in the sand pile. So let me just give you one example. What if I put here, I hope it works. I put here one, one, or maybe just one here. So this is U, V, W, and S. So one V is an idempotent, and that should be represented by this. I'm using the same trick as before. One V plus one V is two V. So this is two. And everything else is zero at the moment, right? But two, one gets out to sing and the other stays. So this is just one. The same trick should be working for this one. And for this, I'm not sure. Maybe I just put one, one, one. I wonder if this works. Let's try. If it didn't work, then we, we think about this a bit more. So what if I say one U plus one V plus one W. So 
So I get 2u plus 2v plus 2w. So I'm in this situation. So this fires, one goes back, one comes here, this is three. You're right. Oops, so this, this is two. Uh, you're right, no, no, you're right. Maybe I should put here two, I'm not sure. So if, if it's one, then it's gonna, st this stays as two. So it's not idempotent. You're right, maybe I just put here two. So you, I'm, I'm ex sorry, I'm experimenting. Okay, so put two at the beginning. And this is one. And this is one. Okay. So now if you add, it becomes four, two, two, four, two, two. What that gives you back this. So this is four. Oh no, because it's gonna fire and then one goes here, one goes here, one. Okay, let me see. One goes here, this becomes three. One goes here, this becomes three. One goes back, so that becomes two. You happy? Because there are four of them. Three of them goes, one here, one here, one back. So four becomes two, so that's that. So this becomes two here. Now this is three, right? So, so I mean, at the moment, two u plus three v, plus three W, I'm in, in this situation now. So two U, I cannot do anything, three V. So one goes out, one comes here. So this becomes two. But again, I can do one more time. So then one comes here, one goes back. So this becomes one V. I think the same story here. So three V, one goes here, one goes here, so this becomes two. Again, one goes here, one goes here, becomes one. So, now it's important. Thank you. And here is the actual theorem. So you know you have to work a little to get to get that. Say it again. Say it again. Yeah, I think zero, 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 zero is an idempotent. And maybe that, uh, that connects to F being empty. Because F being empty is, let's consider that as one, one filter. And everything zero connects to that. Yeah, because look here, I'm just getting the yeah, actual connected, yeah. Okay. Now this is the first time I'm gonna introduce something called the weighted graph and you see it's a very natural, I think definition, but let's, let's do that. So I'm, I'm moving from sand piles to monoids, the, just, just abstract monoids and from abstract monoids to Levit path algebra. See how I'm gonna connect all these together. Okay, so a definition. So a weighted graph. And I write it this way is a pair. This is the usual graph that you have been working so far. It's a directed graph. And so, and W is a map from the edges to natural numbers and I want zero not to be there. So I want to assign to each edge some positive number. How should I write this? Is it this way? If n has zero, if, if you think this set has zero, then I look this. Way. Okay, so for each edge, I just assign some weight, two, three and so on, okay? So this is called a weighted graph. I assign maybe weight two here, weight three, weight one. One more notation. I'm gonna use the weight. I'm gonna use the weight of V and this is the maximum of the weight of E that gets out of V. 
and this v has to be regular at the moment so i'm just going to define wait for regular vertices that edge is getting out i look at all the edges and i get the maximum weight now two two terminologies And tell me if you have seen better name because we just made this up. Tell me if you have seen better names for this. So let's call something vertex weighted graph. So vertex weighted graph, if the weight of all the edges getting out of V is the same, if the weight Yeah, if the weight of all edges emitting from a given vertex is equal. Okay, if that happens, so if they are all five, and this is the case for here also, this is three, all three, this is all one then let's call it vertex weighted graph. And then this number you assign to V basically gives you all these because we know they are all the same. The other one, the other terminology, again, there might be a better name for it. It's called a balanced weighted graph, a balanced graph is a vertex weighted graph with this that the weight is exactly is exactly the number of edges getting out of v so if this is v and there are three edges getting out then the weights are all three if there are two edges going out, then the weights is two. So if this happens, let's call it a balanced weighted graph. Okay. Now, a very general definition of a graph monoid. So this is a weighted graph. Then I'm going to define the monoid assigned to E with the weight W. And you're going to see, you're going to recognize bits and pieces here. Is the free monoid generated by all the vertices as before. So you, you collect all the vertices and you get that many number of natural numbers. The relation is, is this one. You recognize this. So remember that that gives you the usual weighted graph. Now, what I would put here is this weight. Don't get confused with this one. So maybe I just put R. Ah, oh, OK. This is this V and this is the range of V. And remember, if the weight is all one, I can do that, right? You are, you are back to the usual mon graph monoid. So this is like a generalization. And remember the, this uh, mad vet puzzle that I started at the very beginning of this talks. So the mad red puzzle started with one cat going, and then you get a couple of animals. Remember that? And I said, there is another one that I put here three cats and then two dogs. And that has a different sort of flavor. Now, if you want to capture this as a monoid, this three cats is three cats. 
So it becomes this monoid. If you just translate the mad word into monoids, it becomes you're, you're in this setting. Okay, let me just give you an example. So what if you have one vertex, n loops, and they have, each of them has weight n plus k weights. So this is um, a vertex uh, weighted graph. So you have n loops, each of them has exactly n plus k weight for some k. So let me plug in there. So M E W here, you have just one vertex. So it's generated, it's a free monoid generated by this, which is really is N because you just have zero V one V two V and so on. And then V, the weight is N plus K. So you put the N plus K here. And then with the same story, you, you look at the, end of these all the edges getting out of v and you look at its end so n edges getting out and they all end up in v so you get nv this is the relation so here you get really n1 is n plus k1 so this is the monoid so what does that mean it look like to me is you start with zero one two you get to n that's fine there is no relation up to here you can continue you get to nk minus one. And when you get to nk, look, that pushes it back here. So you get kind of a cycle, yeah, cycle here, up to here. How should I write it? So you get to n plus k, n plus k is really n. So maybe I, so this is just that. So here you don't do anything. It's just the usual arithmetic, but here you have to be careful. So this is one example. Now, a couple of things, and I was so happy to see this works. Um, so remember, one of the, in fact, the only tool we had when we were defining graph monoids was Confluence Lemo, because here it's involved, and if I give you two elements equal, that means you, you have to go and get to the second equal. So the confluence theorem works here. Works here. Okay, so now, I, sorry, I forgot to tell you some, something here that changes this definition a little. So I wrote that, and I'm sure in your head you said, oh, okay, I'm writing it for regular ones because regular ones are the ones that things getting out. And you're right, for the usual one, if it's sync, I don't write anything here. Now I want to change that a little. So you have a weighted graph and you have weight of all these vertices, right? And these are the ones that V emit and therefore this is well-defined. If V doesn't emit anything, then I cannot talk about this. But let me put this, and this might come as a surprise for you. What would you assign for a sink. So if it's not a sink, I just get the maximum number here. For the sink, well, I dub, you know, if I want to develop a theory, I would either I put infinite here or I put zero, but I'm gonna put here one. So for sink, this is my definition. If you have a sink, the weight is one. Now I'm gonna write this for any vertex. Okay, so now, would you able to tell me if I have a sink, what number is assigned to the sink here? So it's a matter of being able to read mathematical language. So imagine V is a sink. So the weight of V is one. So I get V here. What do you think I would get here? Say it again. Zero, that's right. Because um, 
it's a sum of this range over empty set. And by definition, the sum over empty set is zero. So I get V is zero. And this is what I want, that in my monoid, anywhere you see sink, I would put zero. And look, remember the sand pile? There's, there's sink is assigned zero. So that's what I want. And the confluence lemma works fine here with all these gadgets that here you put WVV and then you put for sink zero. And well, you have to go through the proof again. And again, as an exercise or as a, because I really like this confluence lemma, can you generalize this? I.e., look, the graph monoid, the way I started here, I have one single vertex with some coefficients is sum of other things. And confluence lemma goes through. Can you kind of generalize that? Maybe here I have a bunch of vertices, I mean, in some way, and equals to something else. So I start with this kind of relations. Can you still have confluence? I know, again, I'm vague, but somehow generalizing this and then proving confluence lemma there. Okay. Now, let me give you an exercise, um, example, maybe. So, first of all, if you have a sand pile situation, I'm just showing you one bit of that. What was the story here? It was that you have some numbers, and the sum, these numbers you can dis basically distribute if the number here is equal or more than the edges getting out. So if you had four, and there are four things going out, what you get, so if you had four u, what you get is one u, one v, one w, one z, right? That became one, 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 one. If you had here one v, v is gets to s, and this is zero. Now, have a look at this graph and look at the relations I put here. If you give this graph a balanced, just give this graph a balanced weight. Meaning, look, there are four edges going out, so I give the weight four to all of these. One edge going out, I give weight one. So out of the usual graph, I can always come up with a weighted graph, just putting the number of edges in there. If I do that and I plug it in here, I get the exact same relation as sand pile, that game. So the sand pile of E is really the Levitas, oops, the, the M, E, W, and this is the balance. So I captured the theory of sand pile using this one. And in fact, this gives you a lot more examples. So sand pile is just one example of this. So this is the game, well, you can play. You, look at, you can look at the literature in sand pile and see what, of, what are those theorems are actually really depends on sand pile or which theorems are actually you can prove in a more general setting. And let me give you one example of those that you can actually prove in more general setting. So what I'm gonna write here, it was proved by Babai in this one, but you can see actually it goes through for any of these. And these are natural questions, I would say. So facts, so let me just put facts or theorem. So you need to write a bit of So remember, I'm writing in the language of now graph monoids. And suppose S is a subset, the set of vertices not connected to any cycle. 
So you have your graph E, and I collect those vertices which are not connected to any cycle, right? So this Z is connected to one cycle. This is connected to a cycle, it's sitting on a cycle. This is the only one which is not connected to any cycle. I collect that, that would be my the set S, okay? Collect all the, the ones that are not connected to the cycles. And the first natural question is that, when is this monoid is a group, right? So this is a group. If and only if E is acyclic. I, there, there are no cycles in your graph. Two, well, it could be not group, but it could be kind of close to the group. Me is co-final, a conical, I always mix this. Conical means x plus y is zero, then both of them are zero, conical. If and only if, If and only if any non, yeah, any vertex in S has weight one. So you can precisely say when two numbers is zero, it forces both of them are zero, your graph should have this property that the vertices which are not connected to cycles they all have have weight one okay. and i think we have like two two theorems but i'm sure there are a lot more one can prove so this is something we're hoping to do No, uh, it, this, this works, if I'm not mistaken, this works for any weighted graph. So it could be you're in this situation that this has two, one, five. So it doesn't have to be a balanced or vertex. Yeah. No, no, no. That means that you look at the, so maybe I'm in this situation. Okay, so remember the weight that I defined for a vertex is the maximum of the weight of the edges. So when I say that the S, these are the vertices, has weight one, that means that yeah, being acyclic, that means everything is in S. A cycle means there, there are no cycles. Yes. Do I need to put balanced here? Maybe I need to put, yeah, I see your point. Okay, for the moment, because. I don't want to get stuck. I put here balanced graph, and then I have to think about what you said. So balanced graph gets out of that, I think. Because that means anything should have, to, should have only one edge getting out. All right. You're right, you're right. I see what's your point. Say it again, say it again, say it again. Yeah. 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 But wouldn't this here you get for this kind of things, 
you get zero because look, you are thinking of ME. In here, I put that S is zero. The last one is zero, but the way you define ME, usual one, I don't put anything for sinks. You know what I mean? Okay, so here, if you have five, two, one, three, S, all of this is you're gonna push and you get to S and we put, we get, you get zero. But so in ME, when I define, I don't, I don't put anything for zero. But for ME, you don't put that there. So that's the problem yours, yeah. So maybe this is also true for anything. Yeah, so you don't need that. So I was okay all the way. Really tries to confuse me. <laughs> okay, so let me give you an example. And you see, look, you have to just do a bit of work here. So this is the example. So I'm in this situation, and there are no cycles. So everything is a sink. Oops, there is no cycle, so that means it's acyclic. So I'm in this situation, right? So now, let me just put um, weight one, weight two, weight three, weight one, and weight two. So, and the claim is that the monoid you get is a group. So let's try. So can we write this here, the M, E W. So let's try and follow me here so that I don't make mistakes. So you have U, and the weight of U is the maximum weight getting out. So weight of U is three. Weight of V, the maximum weight getting out is two. And the relation was the weight of U. U is well, all of these getting out. You look at the the range. So I get V. V and W. So I get V plus V plus W. So this is the first one. And this is three. This is the first relation. Let me write the relation for this. So you get weight of V times V. So that's two V is equal to W and W. And this is a sink. And this is the where the difference comes in. So the weight is zero. So these are my relations. So I have a monoid generated by V, W, and U subject to these relations. And my claim is that this should be a group. So let's simplify. If W is zero, it's not going to contribute here because it's zero, right? Now, W plus W, zero plus zero, so here I get two V is zero. I'm not saying V is zero, twice V is zero. And then what do I get here? Uh, three, v, three U is zero. So the relations I get is U, V, three U is zero, two V is zero. And you must be, you know, very good to just look at, glance at this and tell me this is a group. I cannot, I, I need to write down, say, the, the table. So let's do this as an exercise. So you have zero, U, V, zero, U, V. So zero, U, V, I'm just adding them, U. Say it again. Possibly. So Z2, Z3. Yeah, I think you are right. I think you are right. So let me just write down a couple of these. So you have 0UU, 
and here you have u to u and u plus v so i have add, to add them to u and to u um, is not zero and uh, u plus v and then here i have v u plus v v plus v is 2v but 2v is zero so let me continue to u and u plus v um, to u u plus v and so on i'm just trying to do this so that you see you have to do a bit of work so u plus 2u is zero and u plus here i get 2u plus v that's a genuine element so i'm just going to add that here and I continue, so I get u plus 2u and v, so that gives me v. Okay. And I continue. Let me just do one more and I stop there. So v plus 2u, that's that. v here, I get u plus 2v, which is u, because 2v is 0, and I get here 2u. Now, you can do the rest here. But what I can see is that when I walk along these, I always get a zero. So that means u has an inverse. Here also v has an inverse. So it's a monoid, and each element has an inverse. I'm sure if you continue somewhere along the line here, you get zero. So it's a monoid, and it has zero. Therefore, it's a group. And I'm sure you are right here, but you have to write this isomorphism. Yeah, good. Yeah, I said u to one and zero and v to zero and one. I just make sure that this works this is working so you have a monoid from you have me to here already and then i have to show that it's injective and surjective yeah yeah yeah, yeah. three this is three and two because this three goes to here and two. yeah all right Oh, I don't have that much time, so let me, I have to be a bit more quick here. So let me now connect this with Levitas algebra. That was this bit of the talk, Levitas algebra. Okay. So you have seen Levitas algebra. So I'm going to introduce something called weighted Levitas algebra. And very quickly, so what I'm going to write, you have seen it like the last two weeks. So what was LN that Levit? introduced so the way Levitt introduced he said well get bunch of xi and bunch of yi these i's from one to n so just these symbols and generate a free algebra with units and the relation he put here is y1 to yn x1 to xn it forced this to be one so when you multiply a row with a column you get one element and he forced this to be one and as you do in mathematics, you flip the order. And now you get an n by n, n by n matrix, but now force this to be a matrix which has one on diagonals everywhere else zero. So he, he, he introduced this. That's not very difficult to just write. But two things he proved, and those are difficult. First of all, let me call it A. This A is not zero. This is not easy to see. I mean, I cannot see from that definition that could be you put two relations here, it collapses the whole thing to zero. That is possible, right? Then you have nothing to work with. So he proved this is not zero. And he proved what uh, Willie mentioned also, that if you get an element in A, it's guaranteed that you hit this element from right and left with two other elements, and in one go, you get an identity. So it's much more than simple ring. So he proved that. And then 
he said in the next paper, why should I stop here? Why should I look at just one row and one column? Why should I, I not just look at a matrix? That's possible, right? So then he said, okay, so I'm gonna, and I'm writing it here. If I'm making a mistake with indices, just be kind with me. So he just bunch of symbols here, I from one to N, maybe J from one to M. And then he put here matrices, one, 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 one M, and the same for X. And he forced this to be now, this is, has N rows and M columns, M columns and N rows. So I N times N, okay? And then he flipped this and said, Imagine X times Y becomes I M times M. So this gives you another algebra, right? I know it's very, you know, it's not easy to glance and say what kind of properties you have, but he proves that this is not zero. I think this, this is the one that I always emphasize. I mean, I'm more scared of this part because look, you can put whatever you want here, right? And you get your own personal ring, but what are the chances that this is not zero? So, I mean, you can put A, B, and I don't know, if you are listening to ABBA, you can say A, B, B, A is one. This is your ring. So, but what are the chances this is not zero, right? Okay, he proves this is not zero, and in fact, he proved something even inter more interesting, that A is a domain. And again, I don't see Namely, if you multiply two elements, and this is not zero, this is not zero, then you would expect this would not be zero. And this happens here. And you, you remember in this unit, when you were working with the Wittpass algebra, it had full of zero divisors. These rings has, this ring has a lot of full uh, zero divisors, but this doesn't. It's a domain. It's very interesting. Now, I know that this kind of things you can get out of graphs. This is the starting point. And the question was, okay, so now you have this. Can you get a graph and get this one? And the, the answer is no, and that's why we weighted levit path algebra. Why is that? Because I just said that these, these are domains. Okay, these are domains. Now, the Levit path algebras, which are domain, is either this or this, and happens to be commutative rings. The others are not domains because you, you have full of zero divisors. And none of these are of this one because this is not commutative. So the question is that can you, you know, just modify your graph a little bit to get this? And in, um, okay, so I don't have that much time. I'm gonna just, just tell you briefly what's the definition of levy path algebra and put here the connection with SandPy. So, or maybe here I just put H. In order to get that, I start now with a weighted graph. So you have seen weighted graphs. I was talking about the monoid. So imagine you have a weighted graph and E has a weight three. So in my head, if this edge has weight three, I'm imagining that three little E1, E2, and E3 are getting out. If this has say weight, uh, weight three, then three edges getting out. If this has weight two, then two is going out. Now, what, how do you write the relations, the Levit path algebra relations? In the usual case, the way you did that, you said, I const I'm standing here, I walk along E, I come back, 
I imitate with F, I come back and I retrieve U. That was the relation. As if you, you know, the light's getting out and you then pull the whole thing out. So this is the thing. For the weighted one, now use a bit of imagination. Imagine you have three layers of graphs, okay? And do this for each layer. So layer one, E1, U. Layer two, layer three, okay. But now, you can go from E1 and come back with E1 or E2 and E2. But now if you change layers, no. If you go from E1 and change layer and come back with E2, that's also possible. And you imitate that with the next one, then you would get zero. So you are not allowed to change layers when you are moving. So this would be one of those, I, I don't know, this is CK1 or CK2, I'm not sure which one. So. Now the CK, the other one was in the usual case, showing you that it's not symmetric. So you start with the real one going back with the edge, you have to imitate. But if you start with the edge, uh, the ghost, and back, that right away gives you this, right? How about here? Okay, with the CK1, um, again, I'm not sure if it's CK1, with one of these relations, I have to go through the whole layers, right? E1, E1 star, F1, F1. For the other one, I stand with, if, even if there are others coming, I just concentrate on this and go through the whole layer. So I write H1, H, H1 star, H1 h2 star h2 and then that gives me u so i skip an edge and i go through the whole layers of h here i keep the layers and then i write on the layers but here i go through the whole layers and this is the weighted levit path algebra you can define and amazingly you can see You, what you can see is that now the theory it just imitates itself and the, the monoid you assign to this is pretty much this one that I defined before. Uh, again, you have, I'm just simplifying things because there was this sink and so on. But if the weight is one, I recover the usual one that you, you have seen we had before and again if you remember i said that for specific ones this recovers the sand pile so if you had a sand pile so in one part you had sp of e then i realized that as me in that general setting and now i'm telling you that this is this v of coming from this algebra so it makes sense now that I call this a sand pile algebra. And I think this opens the door because you had this sand pile model. This is a monoid you assigned to this. Now you have an algebra. So the question is, what can you get out of the structure of a monoid? And the, I mean, yeah, relating the structure of a monoid and to this algebra. For example, you, you remember I was talking about the idempotence here. Can you relate that idempotence with the ideals of this algebra? And then you have a sand pile group. If you go through this, this becomes the K0 of this weighted Levit path algebra. And that's nice because now you have an algebra and you have this machinery, not only K0, you have all kinds of things, K1, K2, and so on. And maybe that would tell you more about GE and therefore your sand pile. I just leave you with uh, one survey on these algebras. So, by Raymond Prusa, Poisa. It's called the weighted 
Levit path algebras, an overview. It's in archive. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, it it doesn't. So I think it did completely different. And the, the the idea is that look, in all the other structures that you have, you know, CK one is a sum. CK two is just one item. But here is the first time that the CK two is also a sum. Right. CK one is okay, similar to before. It's before, but CK two is not a sum. So the, what the what they say like CK one is an algebra, CK two is just an inverse semigroup kind of because it's just product, and you can get inverse semigroups out of that. But here you have a sum, and that makes it more difficult in a way. Any other questions? So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And well, let's go for for lunch and uh, resume in the afternoon.